So we're just waiting a few moments until we have all of our guests arrive. So you're just listening to a little bit of Brad Meldow um, playing a very famous song, Blame It On My Youth. participants heading up to 100. Uh, we have 185 registered, so we'll, we'll kick off in just a few minutes. In the meantime, you're just stuck with me. minutes past the hour. We might kick off um, in just another minute or two with just over 100 people. So, so welcome everyone to our webinar. Um, thank you for registering and joining with us tonight. Um, this is our first webinar. So if I cock it up, please don't yell at me. Um, so we have 185 registrants and we have a, an interesting program tonight. We've decided to highlight just a few of the areas that we've been working on here at the Motor Neuron Disease Research Centre at Macquarie. And due to this virus, you know, it's sort of snookered our ability to talk to you about what we've been doing. So we thought we'd take this opportunity to share with you some of our achievements over the past year and also where we're heading in our fight to beat this wretched disease, motor neuron disease. We're very fortunate to have um, Ian Blair and Julie Atkin talking to, with us tonight about their advances in motor neuron disease research in genetics and Julie in mechanisms of disease and new therapeutics. I'm also delighted to introduce Justin Yerbury from the University of Wollongong and Kirsten Harley from the University of Sydney to give us their unique perspectives on motor neuron disease. I'm going to finish with where we're at in two of the trials that we've completed here at Macquarie and where we're heading with our trials for new therapies to slow and stop motor neuron disease. And then we're going to have 20 minutes for questions and you'll see that there's a Q&A uh, block on your Zoom. So if you, if you have specific questions that you wish to raise about what is presented tonight, then we're going to deal with the questions from 7.10 to 7.30. Hopefully we'll get to all of the questions, but if, if not, don't worry, we're actually recording this webinar and it will be available for distribution and there'll also be a transcription of the webinar. And furthermore, if there are questions that we don't get to through the presentation, you can always send them in to us and we'll deal with them one by one. So we have quite a packed program and I'm going to hand over to Ian um, now to talk to us about the tremendous advances uh, that 
he's made, he and his team have made in genetics of motor neuron disease, understanding both the genetic causes of familial motor neuron disease and also the genetic susceptibility in sporadic motor neuron disease. So it's really weird just talking to a screen um, and not getting any feedback. I promise I'll try not to swear. Uh, well, I'll try not to swear, but if I mess it up, you know, hopefully we can bleep that out. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ian now and uh, welcome. Well, thank you, Don. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I've got my tech working too. I'm now sharing my screen that I believe, I hope you can see. Don, can you see this? Yes, we can see that. Thank you. Great. Right. Thank you. Well, thanks, Don. That's uh, welcome, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to be talking to you and describing some of our uh, research outputs tonight. Um, I will be focusing on some of our genetic work, our genetic discoveries. Um, we're giving you a very broad overview. Um, but what I'm showing you here is the cover of our, our biannual report which we put out last year, um, that outlines our research program. Um, this report's freely available on our website and I encourage you to read it. Um, apart from uh, illustrating our research program, it showcases some of our research outputs. Um, but it also lets you get to know some of our, um, some of our research staff and students, um, particularly um, uh, some of the early career researchers and the mid-career researchers. Um, many researchers who have dedicated their careers to trying to understand the causes and solve MNDs and, and various reasons, some of them quite personal. So I encourage you to look at that. And our mission, well, our vision is a world without MND and our, our mission, we believe we've devel developed a research program that best tackles the disease, um, a, a complex disease, and we're attacking it from different angles. And we feel we've developed the best program that can develop new strategies for diagnosing and um, treating the disease in the long term. MND is a complex disease. There are no two patients develop the disease in the same way, and the disease not, does not progress in any two patients the same way. It is complex, um, but what we've developed is this integrated, um, what we call a multidisciplinary research program, uh, multiple scientific disciplines um, from which we can attack the disease from different angles. Um, but as you see in the bottom right, I say collaboration is key. And in establishing this center, one of our core principles is to facilitate and be really be a catalyst for collaboration within Australia and um, across the world for, to grow M&D research in Australia and really punch above our weight. And we really do punch above our weight in, uh, when I'm talking about Australia as a, as a research enterprise of m and Genetics and genomics is the, at the top there and I lead that team. And that's what I'm going to try and talk to you today. Um, why, why study the genes? Well, we know that there is a proportion of, uh, of individuals who develop the disease and it is inherited. So it's a familial form of the disease and discovering the genes that cause those, that familial form is, is absolutely critical to understanding the disease in those families critical to diagnosing the disease and we now know that it, it looks very hopeful for developing treatments and and um, uh, but we also now recognize that the sporadic form of the disease um, 
arises from a combination of genetic risk and environmental risk. So environmental and genetic risk factors combine to um, cause sporadic human bleeding. And we, we've recently discovered and published that, that genetic risk factors are a um, burden of genetic risk factors. The greater number of risk factors you carry, the worse your prognosis is. Um, Genes are also critical for identifying the subsets of patients that are most likely to respond to a treatment. Now, we, as I mentioned, no two patients develop the disease and, and their disease progresses differently. We recognize now that no one treatment will be suitable for all patients. And we know now that genetics, the genes will be key to identifying which patients will respond to treatments. Um, but also the genes allow us to really understand the biology of the disease because we can use the genes to mimic the disease in the laboratory. And that gives us the tools, the power to uh, develop, uh, understand the biology, but to develop and test treatments in the laboratory. So when I'm asked, um, you know, are you making progress? And that's what you are here to hear about today. And I think, you know, I think Dom's gonna talk about some new drugs and we can talk about some of the very large uh, genetic studies of which we are part of. Um, perhaps the best way I find, uh, I think to illustrate um, our progress is to look where we've come from, um, how far we've come with genetic studies. And then we look back, 1880 was when the first MD family was described in the literature. And it was the Farr family from Vermont in USA, where up to 50% of, of individuals in any generation developed MD. Now, it was over 100 years. So the next most significant uh, scientific discovery in MND, and that was with the pathology, what we know as the ubiquitin pathology, that's key. So those dark times, over 100 years of, of understanding very little about the genetics of MND and understanding very little of the um, biology of MND at all. But it was the early 1990s that the first gene was discovered and it was SOD1 and it was indeed identified in that first family described the Farr family from Vermont in the USA. So it took us 113 years to identify that first gene in MND. Um, I joined the search for MND genes in 1990 when I moved to the University of Washington um, in Seattle, USA. And we were searching for, bravely I think, searching for MND genes. What chance did we have, given it took over a hundred years to find the first one? Well, we had some, um, some fortune on our side, great support from the families, and we did indeed identify the second MND gene in 2004. You'll see along the bottom there, it only took us 11 years to find the second gene. That was a gene known as Cenotaxel. Just four years later, after I'd returned to Australia and we started a gene discovery program here in Australia. And this is this third gene. It was one known as TDP43, which some of you will be aware of. And it was discovered by um, studying Australian families. And this is where I think Australia is now recognised. And this is where it stemmed from. We really do punch about our way in genetic studies of MD. But the next gene came just one year later. So I think you'll see along the bottom where we're moving, how fast our, our um, discoveries have accelerated. And it was on the back of that of that accelerated discoveries that, that I, along with um, four other leaders in MD research across Australia, decided we'd come together to establish and build what is now 
the Macquarie University Centre for M&D Research. And we came together with a really strong, uh, a strong goal, and that is to bring together different disciplines in science to attack the disease from multiple angles and collaborate. Really, be, really become a catalyst for uh, driving M&D research, growing M&D research, and um, facilitating collaboration within Australia and internationally. Now we leap to, we come back to the genes, and we leap to today, and you'll see what we've accelerated. We've now um, discovered over 30 genes involved in both familial and sporadic MND. We've really accelerated, that's where we've come from. What does it mean? What's the impact for patients of these gene discoveries we've had to date? Well, for those families that uh, where the gene is inherited, the disease is inherited, then that is key symptomatic, symptomatic testing aids in you know, diagnosis and facilitating the best clinical management. But as I mentioned, there are, there are a combination of genetic and environmental risk factors, and we increasingly recognise that these will be key in predicting progression, identifying those individuals who, who will respond to therapies. It's informing genetic counselling. And perhaps one of the most exciting parts is that we are able to now facilitate pre-implantation genetic diagnosis at IVF for those families who wish to um, have children and prevent the transmission of a gene to the next generation. In this case, where just at IVF, a few cells can be taken from a fertilized embryo and tested to ensure that the embryo transferred to the mother does not carry the mutation. And indeed, Dom um, is very, as, as we all are very proud of um, babies born through, through the MD clinic. So we've done very well with the familial genetics. The sporadic genetics is where much of our efforts now are moving, uh, moving forward. And we know that both environmental and genetic risk factors contribute about equally. I've mentioned this earlier. And it genetic factors also contribute uh, to the variability in the um, age of onset, the rate of progression. And we, under, we recognize that if we are able to identify those genetic factors that are, are associated with a very slow progression of the disease, then we can use that as a target and we can, we can uh, work towards developing therapies that slow the progression of the disease. Now, how do we know that that there are um, environmental and genetic risk factors. Well, we know that we're exposed to many environmental, um, uh, deleterious environmental factors throughout life. It might be through our own lifestyle, it might be through the workplace exposure, it might be through incidental exposure. Um, but unless you carry the genetic risk, the, the environmental, um, the environmental um, exposure will be a, uh, have of little impact. And how do we know that? Well, there is a, a group in the community which illustrates that better than, than any. And that is our centenarians who, who have seemed to have escaped many of the consequences of the insults from perhaps a, a poor lifestyle or a workplace exposure. They seemingly do not carry the risk, the genetic risk that mere mortals like me and many of us um, would have caught up with us long. Now, identifying these genetic risk factors requires very large, large um, collections of individuals diagnosed with MND. And to facilitate this, um, and this is a, a, a sporadic MND consortium. This is the national consortium called the SALSA, and this was established by the University of Queensland. And Macquarie is the largest contributor to this national consortium to uh, provide genetic data 
Um, and in this case, many of you will be aware of our biobank, the Macquarie, the, uh, Macquarie University m and biobank. And we contribute um, that genetic data to facilitate national research. Um, but of course, it's international research that brings the greatest power. And this is from our, our biannual report that illustrates our international collaborative connections. And one of those key connections is with um, this, the world's largest genetic study in m and called Project Mine. There are over 20 countries involved, of which Australia was one of the founding members. And again, we are really punching above our weight in terms of contributing to, um, to that study. So it's that international large-scale international collaborative research that is key, we believe, to solving the disease. And I just wanted to highlight here, this is over the last eight years since we've been, uh, seven, eight years that we've been um, in existence. This has really been a journey together with um, people diagnosed with m and their families, their friends, and, and I just want to thank you for all your support along the way. So I'll leave it there. Back to you, Dom. Thanks, Ian. Um, so uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Justin um, Yerbury from the University of Wollongong. Justin is a world leader in the concepts of proteostasis leading to um, motor neuron disease and has a unique perspective on the pathogenesis of, of motor neuron disease. Over to you, Justin. Hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us and hearing about the work we are doing to try and understand m and &E. It is critical that we understand the molecular processes that underpin m and &E, so that we might design a treatment that slows the disease. I am Professor of Neurodegenerative Disease at the University of Wollongong, and I have worked very closely with the team at Macquarie for several years. So I am happy to be here talking about some of our work. I am going to tell you about proteostasis, what it means and how it might inform our research and our thinking about therapeutic design. First, I would like to personally thank my team, who do all the actual work in the lab. And although everyone here knows what MND is, at this point I would also like to recognise that there are around 2,000 Australians currently living with MND, and thousands more such as carers, families and friends, constantly living with its impact. It is also important to note that on average, two people die from and another two are diagnosed with them and each day in Australia. It needs to stop. To start to understand the project that I am talking about today, the first thing that I need to explain to you is, what is a protein? A protein is a molecular machine that is made from the instructions stored in your DNA. These molecular machines do vital work in all parts of your body, and include things like hemoglobin to transport oxygen, 
enzymes to digest food, collagen to provide physical structure. In addition, In addition other things like hormones, immune systems, and electric signals in the brain are all also Proteins are able to do all these jobs because each protein has its own unique 3-dimensional shape that has evolved to allow for a very specific function. You can see here colored reconstructions of a range of proteins that allow us to see the amazing diversity of shapes that are possible. All the proteins within a cell are collectively known as the proteome. To help explain this, I am going to use an analogy. If we think of our proteins like the different kinds of vehicles in a city, we start to see a lot of parallels. For a start, we have a certain number of different vehicles that each do very different jobs. And just like our proteins, each vehicle is required in different numbers. We need many more cars than we need fire trucks, for example. Both vehicles and proteins also need to be in the right place at the right time. For example, fire trucks are useless unless they are at a fire emergency. So when we talk about protein homeostasis, we are talking about keeping all proteins made by a cell in a steady state. Which means, making just enough protein, in the right shape, at the right place, at the right time. This might sound simple, but this is not an easy task as there are almost as many individual protein molecules in an average human body as there are stars in the universe. The job of keeping all these protein molecules in balance is a gigantic task, and sometimes, it can be too much for a cell to deal with. In this case, Proteins will accumulate into what we call aggregates, like a traffic jam that has all the cars and trucks are stuck in. We essentially lose the function of whatever is stuck in there. If a fire truck is stuck in a traffic jam I cannot help put out fires. Here on the right is a movie that follows an aggregate forming in a cell, which you can see as a bright spot becoming bigger and bigger, and eventually what you see is that this cell dies in what looks like a little explosion. We think that these protein aggregates trap proteins from doing their normal jobs in the cell and are detrimental to cells. We have performed several studies in this area and our analysis has identified that the cells that die in the MND, called motor neurons, are particularly at risk because their proteins are supersaturated. Supersaturated means that there are so many more protein molecules in solution than what we might expect. You can see from the picture on the left that the inside of neurons are very very crowded. And this is only representing 65 proteins out of possible thousands.
Supersaturation is a word used more generally to mean that a solution has more of a substance in it than possible under normal circumstances. This means that if conditions change, the substance is at risk of crashing out of solution like the supersaturated solution of sulfur here that crashes out of solution and forms crystals. We think that this concept applies to the proteins of motor neurons where the proteins are ready to fall out of solution or aggregate when conditions change. An important part of what we have found is that when aggregates do form, one thing that motor neurons do to respond is that they slow down the production of the proteins that are at most risk. By making less of the at-risk proteins, they make sure that there are less proteins aggregating. However, this strategy used by the cell is like turning off your water at the mains if the bathtub is overflowing. It will stop the bad water, but will also mean lots of other taps in the house won't work. In motor neurons some of the most at-risk proteins are in charge of controlling electrical signals. They do this by moving charged molecules across the boundary of the neuron. By slowing down the production of all proteins at risk, this means that many of the proteins that control electrical signals are reduced. If you look at the graphs on the right you can see the red bars represent less than normal production and green is an increase in production. This tells us that most of the proteins important for controlling electrical signals are reduced. This reduction leads to the motor neurons not firing properly which can be measured in people with MND, and which in some people with MND is thought to result in muscle fasciculation or twitching. As seen here in this person's leg muscle, these motor neurons are thought to be the ones that go on to die. Now that we have gained a little insight into what is happening in motor neurons we have started to think about ways that we can restore the protein balance. First I just wanted to point out that there are several clinical trials targeting protein stasis already happening around the world. One of the things that we are doing is we are trying ways of removing the proteins that are accumulating. We are trying to supercharge the cell's own protein recycling system to remove at-risk proteins. We are also searching for small molecule drugs that may stop proteins from aggregating in the first place. We are working in a few drugs in this area, including trying to improve OVEC over ATSM that we hope will stop one of the MND proteins from aggregating by keeping it in the right shape. Lastly, I want to thank all of my staff and students that do all the work in the laboratory and all of my colleagues here and abroad for their support and collaboration. And thank you all again for listening.
Justin, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. I'm going to now hand on to Julie Atkin, who's going to uh, talk to you about some of her unique work in understanding the mechanisms of signaling and new therapies that will help us in motor neurone disease. Thanks, Julie. Well, thanks for the introduction, Dom. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today, um, I hope you can see that. Um, is that visible to everyone? Yep. Yep. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, and also thanks to Justin because um, that was a lovely introduction to the proteins, which I'm going to cover a little bit in my talk today as well. So, we look at disease mechanisms in MND, folks of research across the centre. I had the cellular, some of the things are also working in the similar space. And it really follows on from in MND. Well, if, I mean, the first we're not working properly, we really want to know what the cause is so that we can fix it. And that might seem obvious. But we're trying to do something similar in MND so that we can design new therapeutics that, that, are, um, that will be helpful. And really, this, this is really the second reason that I want to highlight. So one of the world's largest drug discovery companies, AstraZeneca, did a, a big study a while ago, and they looked at their drug discovery projects that weren't working. So their drugs that had failed. And they analysed the reason why these drugs have failed, they found that the main reason was basic science about the disease mechanisms. So this is a really important concept and by understanding disease mechanisms we help we can design therapeutics that the cells that degenerate and die are motor neurons. And this presents some challenges because motor neurons and cells are quite complex cells. So if you look at this image here, on the far right, we've got some, uh, an example of some blood cells. So these are a range of different blood cells, and these are much more simple than motor neurons, which are shown on the left. So motor neurons have very long processes, and this really makes them very complex cells to work with. And in fact, compared to other types of neurons or nerve cells, motor neurons have got very long processes. And so one area that we've been working in for some time is looking at cellular transport processes because we believe that these motor neurons having such long processes that transport problems could be more important in these cells compared to others. So Ian introduced genetics. That was a fun fantastic introduction to, to genes and Justin's given a love on this in a bit more detail because really proteins are the workhorse of the cell and as Justin um, described proteins need to form this pro the proper conformation so a protein is made basically like a very long ribbon and it needs to fold up in this really specific shape so if you look at this protein shown here I mean, it looks like an old-fashioned telephone cable, and it looks fairly random, but actually this structure is really important. And it actually um, folds up in a way that uh, is, is very specific and enables the protein to function. And if it's not folded up properly, it won't perform its normal function. And you can see this in this region in the yellow, which is what's called the catalytic site of this particular protein, and this enables it to function properly. And what we find in MND, as Justin mentioned, was that these proteins form these aggregates. So on this image on the right, you can see that the normal cell, this particular protein, is found all over the cell. But in the case of the MND protein, it forms these clumps or aggregates. And this could either mean that this protein can no longer perform its normal function, or it sometimes takes on abnormal functions um, and these are, can be toxic. So to study MND in the laboratory, we've, we've set up this basically a, a drug discovery pipeline. 
And I just want to start off with the cell, our cell-based aspect and, and what we, the sorts of assays that we use in the lab. And this is um, a fairly simple assay. Um, but it's quite effective because this is the sort of pathological hallmark in MND, these protein aggregates. And what we do is take this, um, this green fluorescent protein. So this is from a jellyfish. It's from this particular jellyfish shown here. And it's this jellyfish normally produces this green fluorescent protein. And it's found in North America on the West Coast. And it's thought to scare away predators. But we can use this in the lab by attaching this to the faulty MND proteins and then look to see what happens. And if drugs that we design, if we can prevent this um, aggregation. So it's a fairly simple assay, but it's been quite effective. And really, I want to emphasize um, a big advantage of our center is that due to our large size, we're really able to take a multifaceted approach to studying MD. And there are many different techniques we can use to study the disease and each one has its advantages and disadvantages. And so really, if we use these techniques together, we can really build up a very strong picture of the disease. So for example, we, we use cells, we grow motor neurons in the lab, and this is what we can see in this um, set of flasks here. And we can do the assay I've just talked about. But also we can use animal models because obviously cells are very good to look at the fine detail, but they don't allow us to look at what happens in a, an animal. So we have, um, we put the faulty genes into zebrafish and uh, rodents, primarily mice. And these mice and zebrafish develop um, particular motor defects. So in the case of the zebrafish, they are no longer able to swim properly. In the case of the mice, they develop paralysis and um, they both have mo uh, motor neuron abnormalities. We also um, have a fantastic resource at Macquarie, and that's the um, Neurodegenerative Diseases Biobank. So we're able to access a, a range of patient samples that we can also use to look at um, disease mechanisms. We also use post-mortem human tissues as well, which are also good, but we can only look at the very end stage of the disease. So by using this sort of multifaceted way that we can discover um, as much as we can about this disease. And in this slide, um, I want to go to the uh, cell, and I don't want to look at the you know, complexities of the cell, but I just want to highlight some of these areas, some of these mechanisms that are new drugs. So what, um, what I firstly want to highlight is cellular transport, as I've mentioned. So firstly, um, Cellular transport is a mechanism by which um, nutrients are moved around the cell and which waste products are also removed. And so we've identified that cellular transport is actually not working correctly in MND. And from this, we've designed some drug targets. There's also the mitochondria or the powerhouse of the cell. So this, this is where energy is produced in the cell. This is very important, obviously. Um, there's also the endoplasmic reticulum. This is the part of the cell that's sort of like the factory. It makes the proteins. And then there's the waste disposal system. So the garbage disposal system. This becomes clogged up as well. And so this enables us to decipher these mechanisms. And more recently, an area we've been looking at is the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is, as the name sounds, it provides structural support for the cell, but it also takes an active role in disease processes. And so this is, this is a new area that we're working in at the moment. And so we've really established this drug discovery pipeline. So we've, work, we've been working with some medicinal chemists and they've generated a whole series of new drugs for us. And we're screening these drugs at the moment and we've, we've screened about 80 different drugs and we put them through this pipeline. 
So we use our cell-based assays and for this we have a, a high throughput microscopy system. So this was actually one of the first in Australia and this enables us to do microscopy very rapidly. We then identify compounds from this and put them into zebrafish. Identify compounds that are able to restore the swimming ability of these zebrafish. And then we choose the best ones and put them into mice. So in this way, we, we're screening got, um, multiple projects on the go across the centre. And we hope that eventually one day we'll find something that is, is useful. And why haven't we done that so far? Well, I just really wanted to emphasise the drug discovery process. I mean, of the um, many, many compounds that uh, are initiated from basic science, Many of them fail through the drug discovery process, and that's the same for every single disease, unfortunately. There are many problems that are encountered along the way. And we also have an additional problem with uh, neurological diseases, in that we have the blood-brain barrier. So this is a really important um, physical barrier that exists between the blood and the brain, but um, a neurological disease, it's we're, it, it's very hard to put drugs across the brain because of this. So it normally protects the brain from toxins and anything in the circulation that's, uh, that would be toxic. So this is a challenge, but it's something that we're working with at the moment. So really that's um, all I had to say, um, other than I wanted to um, thank all of my team and everyone in the centre. Julie, thanks so much. That was a, a lovely presentation. I'm, I'm, we had a bit of scratchy sound through the through the presentation, so there will be a transcription of of the presentation that will fill in the bits, and also um, a recording that hopefully we can rectify some of the issues that occurred in the sound during Julie's presentation. I'd like to hand over to Dr. Kirsten Harley. <coughs> who's a sociologist from the University of Sydney, who's very kindly going to share with us her unique perspective as a sociologist with motor neuron disease. Kirsten. Hi, I am Kirsten Harley, an honorary lecturer in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney and one of Dom's patients. I am speaking with the help of a neuron note strapped to my wrist and my synthetic voice friend Ryan. You can blame Ryan for any uncouth language. This evening I'm talking about my experience of living with MND. I will be drawing from my paper with Karen Willis, Living with Motor Neuron Disease, an Insider's Sociological Perspective, published in Health Sociology Review last month as well as my blog, Kirsten Harley MND.home.blog. Eight years ago, I was nearing the end of a postdoc at the University of Sydney. My husband, Denzel, and our six-year-old daughter, Kimmy, had flown home from Buenos Aires after a delightful family holiday. I was walking to a cafe to prepare for a conference session on healthcare choice. I tripped and fell flat on my face. There were other falls and cramps when I stretched my quads after exercising. A few months later, after Karen Willis, Fran Collier, Stephanie Short and I had been awarded an Australian Research Council grant to examine how people navigate healthcare, I noticed tired cramping hands. Then I fell once, twice, three times while walking to a post-conference dinner with a friend. I knew that my body was seriously misbehaving. I saw my gorgeous GP, Anna, the following week, and after a careful examination and blood test she rang down. His new colleague was able to see me the next week and initiated a series of tests. On Monday the 7th of January, 2013, Denzel and I held hands in the neurologist's office and were told that I have motor neuron disease. 
We were told the life expectancy varies, but typically people die within two to three years. I thought of Kimmy, our precious six-year-old, soon to start second class, and my world grumbled. The floor, walls, ceiling, our world. Everything grumbled and fell away. We were, of course, shocked and afraid as we started to process the news. As we tried to comprehend that I would lose the ability to move, to speak, to swallow, to breathe, with an unpredictable order and pace of losses. As we started to tell family and friends, in difficult, sacred, love-sharing conversations. As we snuggled in bed with Kimmy, and explained that MND is not the kind of disease that doctors can fix, but scientists are working very hard to understand and cure it. There isn't a single right way to live with MND. Some prefer solitude. Some like to fight. Some keep working. Some hit the road. Some pretend it's not happening. Some get blindsided by its terrible rapid progression. Personally, I have sought out information and stories and community. I have learned to accept the reality of MMT and generous offers of help. I have become something of an unintentional activist and been so proud to watch Kimmy become an amazing awareness raiser. We also instinctively took on Dom's advice take things week by week and try to make the most of each day, and started a series of memory-making holidays with a glorious Tasmanian long weekend of friends, raspberries, penguins and poo machine art. As I tried to make sense of my diagnosis, I turned to our research project, How Australians Navigate the Healthcare Maze, the Differential Capacity to Choose. We developed the sociological notion of healthcare capital to understand how the different kinds of resources, or capital, available to people might open and close different pathways through Australia's healthcare maze. Following sociologist, Pierre Bourdieu, we understood capital as multifaceted, including the economic, cultural, symbolic and social. We added the significance of place in the context of Australia's healthcare system, where access to healthcare resources is shaped by one's location. The gloriously truth-telling Macquarie neurology nurse who saw me on that first day aptly described MND as a shit sandwich of a diagnosis. MND truly is a shit sandwich. It has taken from me arms that could hug, turn pages and swim. It has taken legs that could run, climb stairs and kick off blankets. It meant I had to retire at age 45. It has steamrolled over our family life, rearranging our home, schedules and activities, and stealing our confidence in my longevity. It has killed our friends. It has taken my voice and breathing. It means I need others to get me out of bed to shower and dress me, to feed and move me, to scratch my itches and keep my machines running. And I won't talk about the actual shit. It has been a shit sandwich, for me, Denzel and Kimmy, our families and friends. But, in reflecting on our project about how people navigate healthcare, one of the things I realized, in a very real and personal way, is how much more of a shit sandwich this would be for me if I didn't have my family and friends. I've learned, firsthand, how each of the elements of healthcare capital has made a difference in navigating this challenging journey. We're lucky in Australia to have an excellent public health system, which has offered me free, life-saving emergency care, and universal Medicare and PBS. The support of MND New South Wales and similar organizations helps level out the playing field and, sadly only for people under 65, the NDIS can make a big difference, including funding my round-the-clock care.
But in terms of economic capital, I'm also aware how much harder this would be if we didn't have sufficient economic resources to pay for things like out-of-pocket costs and home adjustments. My cultural resources, boosted by years of university education, and specifically my research and teaching in health sociology, have helped me to make sense of what is happening, to find and read the research, to understand the statistics, and to write about the experience. I can see that place has made a huge difference. Living in a part of Australia where I have access to good health resources contributed to a relatively fast diagnosis and led me easily to my exceptional neurologist, Professor Dominic Rowe, and his fabulous multidisciplinary MND clinic at Macquarie University close to where I live. Dom exemplifies what makes an excellent health professional. Clinical expertise is obviously critically important, but it is equally important for health professionals to recognize the limits of their knowledge, to understand that knowing the disease is not the same as knowing this particular person with the disease, and to be comfortable asking questions and seeking advice collaborating respectfully with both colleagues and the patient and their family. I can see that this would be harder without the kind of symbolic capital that facilitates comfortable interactions and mutual understanding with health professionals. Most of all, I've experienced firsthand the way that social capital, the network of wonderful family, friends and colleagues around me, provides access to a collective wealth of emotional and practical support, expertise, advice, knowledge, contacts, stories, research and experience that overshadows and leverages my own personal resources. Even though MND is a shit sandwich, I have an amazing, kind, strong daughter and husband. And the love, care, support, coffee, humor and joy that I receive from the beautiful family, friends, carers and health professionals around me help make my life very much worth living. Thank you. Kirsten, thank you so much. That was brilliant. Thank you. We're running a little bit behind time, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the trial work that we've completed. But before I do that, and before we head into questions, you know, this, this COVID has skittled many things in Australia. <clears throat> and you've seen, you know, from Ian and Julie and Justin and Kirsten, you know, just a fraction of the the work that goes on in motor neuron disease and the multiple facets involved in motor neuron disease. Um, we have a, an exceptional team here at Macquarie of early and mid career researchers. Um, I'm the old bald fart um, who goes out and bangs the drum. <clears throat> the point of tonight was to actually show you that um, we're still at war and we're still fighting and we're fighting to try and change this disease so that we can eventually slow it and stop it. So it's on that point that I want to talk about some of the trials that we've completed. Um, and now in 2020, there are more than 40 trials going on around the world with unique perspective and aspects to change the biology of motor neuron disease to slow and stop the disease. Because there have to be biological factors that we can leverage to turn everyone into a long survivor with this disease. So I'm just gonna talk about two aspects, the Lighthouse trial that we published last year. <clears throat> so this was a, a, an Australian trial, but we did a lot of collaboration around the world and it's the world's first trial of an antiretroviral therapy in sporadic motor neuron disease to see whether we can slow and stop motor neuron disease. 
<clears throat> so why use an antiretroviral drug? You can't catch motor neurone disease. You can't give it to anyone. Well, there's been a theory for many years that there's an abnormal activation of very old viral remnants that sit in our DNA called human endogenous retroviruses. And a specific one we can demonstrate in motor neurons of the cortex of people who've died with motor neurone disease. So in 2016, we started a collaboration with Julian Gold from the Albion Centre. And really driven by Julian. So, so Julian uh, had two questions for us. Can antiretroviral drugs impact HERV replication? And can antiretroviral drugs change the progression of sporadic motor neurone disease? And this was an unanswered question, even though there'd been about 20 years of evidence of perhaps involvement of endogenous retroviruses in motor neurone disease. So Julian sought and obtained funding for us to conduct the first safety and tolerability study of an antiretroviral drug in motor neurone disease. 40 patients were enrolled at four sites in Sydney and Melbourne. And Julian called it the Lighthouse Project. It had a 10 week lead in observational phase of people with sporadic motor neurone disease who were early in diagnosis. And they received six months of open labeled antiretroviral treatment. So everyone was on treatment. And this drug called Triamec had three agents in it called abacavir, lamivudine and dolutegravir. So I want you to take note of that because there'll be questions at the end. The major objective of this study was, was it safe? and was it well tolerated in people with motor neurone disease? But we also wanted to look for effectiveness measures to see whether there was actually something to work with. So we looked at patients with motor neurone disease, a mean age of 54 years. Um, they were all on Rilazole. They had a mean disease duration of 10 months or so. And it was, again, a fairly typical distribution of motor neurone disease, two thirds men and one third women. The primary outcome was that we were able to demonstrate that Triamec was safe and well tolerated. So there were no significant interactions or, or adverse effects of Triamec in these 40 people with motor neurone disease. There was no drug to drug interaction with Triamec and Rilazole. We had no abnormal biochemical indicators. There were no changes in vital signs of concern and there were no, there were no changes on physical examination other than those associated with motor neurone disease. So we achieved our primary outcome. We could give people Triamec without hurting them. But so what? Well, we looked at secondary outcome measures and we use a score called the ALS FRSR, which is a fairly crude instrument to measure motor neurone disease. We measured forced vital capacity, a neurophysiological measure called the neurophysiological index, and more importantly, we looked at some biomarkers and survival. So this is a, a compound chart of the mean monthly plot of ALS FRSR. And there's a gradient in the 10 week lead up period that was a steeper slope than the gradient of people who were taking the medication. So medication started at at the 10 week mark and we observed people monthly in the 10 weeks prior to starting the medication. And then there was a post study observation. And we were able to demonstrate that the weekly change and monthly change of ALS FRSR was reduced by 60%. So this is a 60% reduction in the rate of change of the measurement of motor neurone disease in the clinic. We looked at the neurophysiological index, which is a reasonably robust measure of changes in muscle together with uh, a special measure called the F wave frequency, where we bounce little electrical signals off spinal cords. And we're able to show that on treatment, that this neurophysiologic index stayed very stable over the six month period. And usually this neurophysiologic index 
just drops off with time in motor neuron disease. So this is on the right side and this is on the left side. So we measured both sides just to make sure that there were no errors. And robustly, we could show that the neurophysiologic index stayed stable through the course of treatment with Triamec. We can measure a marker of disease progression called P75 in urine of people with motor neurone disease. And when we look at what's been published of P75, all patients with motor neurone disease, this P75 goes up with time from diagnosis. And we can correct for several different ways of making sure that that's a robust observation. But basically in all patients with motor neurone disease, this P75 goes up with time. In our patients taking Trimec, we could demonstrate that after people commenced Trimec at week 10, there was a lag where the P75 continued to increase but then with continued treatment, the P75 as a mean observation tapered off. So this is the first demonstration ever in a clinical trial in the world that we can influence P75 in the urine of people with motor neurone disease. We looked at a thing called the NCAL survival prediction model. So this is a mathematical model that looks at prediction of survival over a six month period. And looking at the, the, the characteristics of our patients, it was predicted that during the trial period that we would have two to eight deaths of people with motor neurone disease during the trial study. We actually only had one death of people who were taking Triamec and that occurred four months after stopping therapy. Again, this is a small study and it's open labeled. So we have to be careful about the generalizations that we can make from this data. But most excitingly, we can actually measure HERV-K in the blood of people with motor neurone disease. And this is a slide from our collaborator, Avindra Nath at the National Institutes of Health. And he was able to demonstrate that from baseline at week eight, there was a drop in HERV-K DNA measured in the blood. And then at the six month mark, this was dramatically reduced. So we could actually demonstrate conclusively that we had engagement of the drug that we thought was suppressing HERV-K. We could prove that we suppressed HERV-K. This has led to the Lighthouse 2 trial that starts in a couple of months. And this is again, really the, the genesis of Julian Gold, who's driven this project pretty much by himself. And this is a European, British, we've got to say British because Britain isn't part of Europe anymore, uh, the US and Australia study. And this we've, uh, Julian has managed to rustle up, beg, borrow, steal money to get this up and running and uh, it's really quite a remarkable study that we will be able to prove conclusively one way or the other, can we change the progression of sporadic motor neuron disease by using antiretroviral therapy? And there are multiple endpoints to try and work out whether this study is effective or not, but basically it's a survival study and it does have a placebo arm. Now I'm not a great fan of placebo arms and uh, there are sophisticated ways to try and get around placebos because when you have a disease like motor neurone disease, asking to be signed up to a placebo arm can be problematic. But my voice is pretty much the only voice at the table and we have to try and get this study up and running to prove whether this Trimec can actually change survival or not. So we will enrol 363 patients around the world to try and see whether we can slow and stop motor neuron disease with a simple, well-tolerated antiretroviral therapy. Lastly, I wanna talk about copper ATSM. This is an experimental agent that we hope can slow and stop motor neuron disease using a different mechanism by changing 
or normalizing abnormalities that occur in redox in the central nervous system of people with motor neurone disease. And there's a long history of nearly 30 years of basic scientific research that leads to this place. And in transgenic mice, we can actually change a transgenic mouse with copper ATSM to a normal survival. Uh, and this, this medicine actually also selectively reaches out to the parts of the nervous system that are unhappy. So the motor cortex and the spinal cord. So at the end of 2016, we started this phase one study. It was the first in human study of copper ATSM and here at Macquarie. And it was basically to look at, could we copper, so could we actually get copper ATSM into the blood of people with motor neurone disease orally? Because copper ATSM is, is just about as soluble as concrete. So with special uh, chemical changes to the molecule, we still didn't know whether if you give humans a capsule of copper ATSM, did it actually get absorbed into the blood? And can we get therapeutic levels that were analogous to animal studies? So often patients with familial motor neurone disease don't get included in these sorts of trials, but I insisted when we started that we had to include both familial and sporadic motor neurone disease patients because these mechanisms of abnormal redox are just as relevant in familial motor neurone disease as they are in sporadic. Again, we had a median age of 55. We had uh, five patients who were familial. They were mostly limb onset. And it was relatively early <clears throat> in disease course. Now we were able to demonstrate in escalating doses that we could actually measure copper ATSM in the bloods of people who had taken the capsules. And you think, okay, well, Shouldn't you have known that beforehand? Well, we did from animal studies, but this was a world's first study of giving people copper ATSM. And in fact, one of our panelists tonight, Justin, I hope you don't mind me dobbing you in, but Justin was the first person in the world to take a dose of copper ATSM. We did have some troubles with interactions with Rilazole. We had patients who developed febrile neutropenia, and we have had some troubles with abnormal liver tests with copper ATSM. So this is a drug that needs very assiduous and close monitoring. And in fact, before the trial started, I had a full, full head of hair. We're able to demonstrate that using change in ALS FRSR, we are able to have some effect on the rate of change of, of motor neurone disease with escalating doses of copper ATSM. There was a minor effect on respiratory function, but again, the numbers of this open labeled study were very small. So a couple of kilograms of salt has to be taken with this um, result. So currently we're just heading towards the end of the phase two study in of copper ATSM in, in motor neurone disease. And again, this is a placebo controlled study. So for the first six months, Patients who've, who, who are enrolled into this study, half of them will be taking an identical placebo as to the investigational product. And we should be finished this enrolling in this study over the next couple of months. And again, COVID that skittled many, many things uh, in our society has also skittled um, how quickly we've been able to enrol people, particularly with, with border lockdowns and precautions of patients coming into sites like clinical centres. So I'd like to finish there. And uh, we do have a few questions that have been sent in. And um, so again, for everyone, we're running a little bit behind time. Um, I, I, I would really like to um, I'll save my thanks, I guess, to closing remarks in about 10 minutes or so, but um, we have a few questions and what I might do is, is triage them to um, uh, the various panelists. So uh, ready to 
kick off. Um, so the first question comes in from Magali. Uh, and um, I might get Ian to, to answer this question if I could. The, the question from Magali is, do we know what are some of the conditions that allow genes to express themselves and develop into the disease? That's a great question. Um, this is based on the idea that with different patients, patients uh, progress at different rates. And as we know, some will, some will progress rapidly, some will live for many, many years. And this is uh, one of our major, major research programs is to identify those, find out what it is unique about those who have lived for many years. Because if we can identify it, um, whether it be an environmental factor or, or a genetic risk factor or something that underpins uh, that progression, then that becomes our, our target for slowing progression. And that's what something that Dom alluded to. So we have, that's one of our major research programs and that's led by a very talented um, group leader called Kevin Williams. You can read all about him now. Now, in your report. So if I can invite um, the, the other panellists to, um, to switch their cameras on. And uh, we have a few other um, uh, people on camera too. I'd like to uh, welcome Roger Chung, Angela Laird, Marco Morsch. Uh, we have Albert and we have Gilles. Do we have Gilles or has he dropped out? No, uh, he's dropped out. Anyhow, um, look, uh, again, if I can, I can, uh, Kirsten, I have a, a, a comment to, directed at you, if I can, um, from Camille. Thank you, Camille. Not a question, a comment for Kirsten. You spoke so eloquently. Um, the gratitude you express for having access to treatment and incredible support of your family was extraordinarily moving. And I'd like to concur. I'm grateful for having heard you speak tonight. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is for Gilles, if he's on. Uh, no, okay, I might come back to that. The next is uh, a question back to you, um, Ian, is um, from Steve. If there are 30 genes now found to be involved in motor neuron disease, if you have one of these genes, will you definitely develop motor neuron disease? Yeah, good question. So this very much depends on the gene. Without being specific, some genes are what we call highly penetrant, that, that if you have the mutation, you are likely to get the disease. But other genes are not. They're not, by that I mean, if you get the mutation, you don't necessarily develop the disease. Um, so it's a very much a, a gene by gene case. And of course, with the risk, the risk variance, it's a combination of, of, of risk genes that are required. And you only inherit half your genes from, from a parent. So, and that's why uh, those risk genes for the sporadic MND, it do not, um, it, uh, not, it's not inherited. But yeah, it's a very much a gene by gene basis. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I guess the next question is for me. Um, you're not supposed to ask me questions. Um, what impact does the timeliness of diagnosis have? Well, um, getting, getting access to accurate uh, diagnosis is critical in uh, many aspects of dealing with motor neurone disease. And we often have patients who come to us um, that their, their, their diagnosis may be delayed for one reason or another. And um, uh, it, it can be very tricky to, uh, to manage situations when patients um, present, for example, in, in severe problems with respiratory failure or malnutrition because they're not eating and swallowing. So the, the you know, um, most GPs will never look after a patient with motor neurone disease just because of the disease frequency. So awareness is, is, is a big issue and getting, um, uh, getting patients diagnosed early, but also most importantly, getting them, getting access to 
multidisciplinary, integrated, coordinated care is, is really critical in, in helping people with motor neuron disease, not only adjust to the diagnosis, but to, to change outcome. We know that multidisciplinary care doubles people's survival. So it's, it's not rocket surgery, it's very simple care, but we can double people's survival with good integrated care. Uh, and I'll stop banging on there. I just have a comment here from the UK, from Helen, who um, she has just said, I haven't got a question. I just wanted to thank everyone because the presentations were superb and moving. Thank you, Helen. Um, so a, a question from um, uh, Steve. Um, if, if three people in the same cul-de-sac um, die from motor neuron disease, would that be considered to, actually it's from Sandy, would that be considered to be environmental? Um, yes, uh, we, we do suspect that there are environmental triggers and Ian touched on this, that there is, you know, it's gonna be a genetic predisposition, but depending on the environmental trigger, um, there, there is highly likely to be an environmental trigger for some people with motor neuron disease. Um, let me see. How much funding is available for motor neuron disease and how is the centre funded? Um, um, Julie, can I, can I pass that to you? Because I'll, I'll just bang on again. You've got to be sick of the fat little bald guy talking. Sure. Um, well, we get funding from a range of different sources. Um, we, you know, we've been very successful in getting funding in the centre. We get grants from the um, various philanthropic organisations, um, such as the MNDRAA, Fight MND, and we also have grants from the National Health and Research Council in Australia. So, um, and also the Australian Research Council. So we really um you know have a, a broad range of funding that that we access we get a, a small amount of funding as well from the university um but yeah we um we, we have a number of different lines of funding but it's always a challenge of course um we never have enough money to to do everything that we want to do so we're always you know we always these i mean lab work is is very very expensive and and the clinical trials are even more expensive. So yeah, we, we never have enough to do what we want to do, but um, yeah, we, we do the best with what we have. In closing, I'd just like to thank Ian, Justin, Julie, Kirsten for their fantastic presentations. I'd also like to thank Leslie Malaki, who's been fantastic in pulling this all together the support of Anne-Marie Dobner and Ben Jordan, and Dominique Orth from Macquarie University Events has been fantastic. Um, we hope that we're gonna do this again in another couple of months and we'll be able to highlight the spectacular work of other team members that you see in front of you. Um, I'd like to thank you all for logging in on a Wednesday night, a cold Wednesday night at the end of winter. It would be great to see the end of this disease. I think we're all unified in that and we need to scream and yell from the rooftop until we have the tools that enable us to do it. So again, thank you everyone.